Welcome to our services tonight. We're glad that you're with us. We appreciate the little golf clap. We could tell your heart was really in it. That's all right. We'll get you back sometime. Hey, are you glad to be in God's house tonight? Well, we're glad. There you go. We're glad that you joined us, whether you're joining us online or in the auditorium. Would you stand as we worship the Lord together in song? Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites the chosen people come and die. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. The disciples came to land, thus obey Christ's command, for the Master called unto them, come and die. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire, thus he satisfies the hungry every time. Come and dine, the Master calleth, come and die. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine, to the hungry call it now, come and dine. Soon the Lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the hosts of heaven will assemble be. Oh, it will be a glorious sight, all the saints in spotless white, and with Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and dine, the Master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call it now, come and die. I forgot I was supposed to talk. I was singing, sorry. Aren't you thankful that he calls us to come and dine? Wow, at the master's table. Not, 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 not golden corral. Man, at the master's table. Isn't that good? We always invite you to memorize scripture with us. This is a simple verse found in Daniel chapter 3. If you remember Daniel chapter 3, there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're fixing to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to execute them, kill them, because they wouldn't bow to his golden idol. You know what the three Hebrew children said? Here it comes. You ready? You sure? Read it with me. If it be so... Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning furnace. And He will deliver us out of Thine hand, O King. Daniel 3, 17. Say it again. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning furnace. And He will deliver us out of Thy hand, O King. Daniel 3, 17. Did you get those words that God is what? Able. No matter what it is, what enemy we face, guess what? Our God is able. So I don't know what you're battling tonight, what you're struggling with, but I'm here to tell you, our God is able. Our God is able. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you are able. Lord, sometimes we turn to our own resources and our own energy and our own strength, and God will never, will never be victorious that way. So Lord, tonight as Christians, remind us that our God is able. He's able to save. And if there's anyone here tonight who does not know Christ as their Savior, God is able to save to the uttermost. It does not matter where we've been, what we've done, or how long we have been there. God is able to forgive and set us free. Lord God, you are also able to provide, protect, strengthen, give grace in time of need for those who know you as their Savior. God, you are able. Lord, sometimes we fight things and we struggle with things that are bigger than us. We have no answer. But we have a God who is able. A God who is victorious. A God who is omnipotent. And so, Lord, we worship that God tonight. Lord, thank you that you have invited us to come into your presence and dine tonight from the Word of God. From the very presence of God, we are feasting at your table tonight from your word and your spirit. 
And it's in your precious name that we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages safe from all the storm that rages, rich but not from Satan's wages. I'm standing on the solid rock. Even though he's gone now, I don't feel alone now. With comfort came the Spirit of the Lord. Me from temptations, hide me. I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages safe from all the storms that rages, rich, but not from Satan's wages. I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages safe. From all the storm that rages, rich, but not from Satan's wages, I'm standing on the solid rock. I invite you to stand as we get prepared to worship the Lord. Our ushers will come forward at this time. We'll ask the blessing over our taking of the offering this evening. Then ask that you would remain standing as we continue to worship the Lord together in song. Brother Steve Holland, would you lead us in the offertory prayer? Would you remain standing as we worship? I thought number one would surely be me. I thought I could be what I wanted to be. I thought I could build on life's sinking sand but i can't even walk without you holding my hand i can't even walk without you holding my hand the mountains too high and the valleys too wide down on my knees I learned to stand Lord I can't even walk without you holding my hand I thought I had done a lot on my own I thought I could make it all I thought of myself as a mighty big man, but I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. The mountains too high and the valleys too wide. Down on my knees, I learned to stand. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Sing that chorus again. I can't even walk. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. The mountains too high and the valleys too wide. 
down on my knees I learn to stand Lord I can't even walk without you holding my hand you may be seated I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 21. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a forewarning here, and then we're going to talk a couple of things. You're going to need a, to really understand this tonight, you're going to need a pen or pencil and a piece of paper. So if you've got something out where you can write some things down, it's going to help you understand some things. It's not going to be up on the screen. And so I just kind of need you to kind of follow along with me. Some of you guys take notes. I know that, uh, but if you don't, this will kind of be one of those things where I'm going to encourage you uh, to have some kind of visual of what I'm talking about here tonight. It's very important, if you will. While you're doing that, I'll let you get some of those things ready. Don't forget to pray for Sister Sandra Steiner. Sister Sandra is over in St. Vincent North, uh, had some breathing issues and some blood pressure, high blood pressure problems. Uh, they're actually going to do a scan tomorrow to see if she might have some clots uh, there in her lung. So I want you to continue to pray for Sister Sandra, family, the doctors, as they work with her. Obviously, keep Brother Jerry in your prayers. Those that have been battling some physical needs along the way. Um, I mentioned it to our Bible study on Wednesday night. Uh, I, I encourage you, pray for Brother Don, Sister Rowena Robinson. Uh, I've got a number and an address for them. Uh, that's kind of changed over the several, last several months. And if you'd like a way to call them or contact them, talk with them, uh, it's hard for Sister Rowena to get out right now with uh, some of the dementia problems she's dealing with. So if you guys would like to talk with them, uh, I've got some numbers and addresses where you can get a hold of them. Uh, so uh, remember that, if you will. Also, uh, Brother Dale Thomas's grandson, Nathan Nathaniel Hewitt, uh, is over in the hospital in Tulsa. Uh, probably going to have to do some surgery tomorrow. Uh, he looks like he's been battling Crohn's disease, and they did not know that. And so, probably facing some surgery tomorrow. So if you guys would remember him as a young gentleman uh, that's in need of your prayers, uh, and keep Brother Jim Butler also in your prayers, if you would, uh, over the next several days and weeks uh, as he uh, has this end stage of cancer uh, and they stop treatments with Brother Jim. John chapter 21. We're going to read several verses together to get the whole picture of what's going on. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. This chapter, as I said, is for us as Christians. John included, I think, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this chapter was for us. Those who struggle, those who battle, those who uh, fail sometimes. Um, Jesus is encountering His disciples after the resurrection. Uh, they're on a fishing trip. Uh, they've gone back to work. After these things, Jesus showed Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on the wise showed him, he himself, showed, revealed himself. There were together Simon and Peter, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of the disciples, of his disciples. This is the first time we heard of Nathaniel since chapter 1. But he's always been there. Simon and Peter said to him, I go fishing. They said, we'll go with you. They went forth and entered into a ship, and immediately, and at that night, they caught nothing. They've been fishing all night, nothing. When morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew that it was him, not him. He's some distance away, at least a hundred yards probably. So they can't really know who it is. There was five Jesus said to them, Children, have you any meat? You caught any fish? They answered him, No. They were not happy. I've understood from fishermen you're not supposed to ask if they caught anything, especially when they hadn't caught anything. They're not happy. And he said to them, Cast your net on the other side, on the right side of the ship, and you shall find fine fish. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw in the net for the multitude of fishes. Therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said, uh, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt on his fishing coat, for he was naked, he didn't have on his outer garments, and he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. Now isn't it amazing? Stop just for a minute. There's Peter, who's supposed to be the leader. Caught all the fishes, and what does he do? He leaves them hanging with the fish. Never mind, we'll just keep going. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a cold fire of coals there, 
and fish laid on them and bread. So there's fish already cooking, bread's already been made, Jesus is there. Jesus said unto them, bring the fish, which you've now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the full net full of fishes. Now he comes and helps. And 153 fish are there. Detailed. And for all that were so many, yet not the net was broken. The net should have broke, but it didn't. Jesus said to them, come and dine. What we sang about. And none of the disciples does ask him, who are they? For they, knowing it was the Lord. Then Jesus come and take the bread and give it to them and fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. We got down to verse 6 the last time we were together and Jesus asking those common questions because he cared about his disciples. Caught him fish. He was engaging them personally. He cared about what was going on in their life. The disciples had failed. They had not caught any fish. And in their moment of failure, guess what God does? Jesus speaks to them. He said, I got an idea. Fish on the other side. <laughs> Listen, sometimes if we'll just pay attention, it's amazing what Jesus could do, right? There's two miracles that happen in verse 6. Two miracles. The first miracle is that, one, I think the disciples were obedient. <laughs> I know that's sounding kind of cruel right now. But he said, throw on the other side, and guess what they did? They did it. The miracle of obedience. Now, at this point in time, they probably they don't know that this is Jesus. From everything we can tell in Scripture, they, they didn't know this was who it was. And so what do they do? They're taking advice from a stranger standing on the shore who says, cast on the other side. It was no easy task to move that lead-weighted net from one side of the boat to the other. It was not something simple. This was not just a bunch of cords tied together. They were weighted to hold the fish. In. So to move it was a great task to happen. So they decide to become obedient. John wants us to see there is, I think, an amazing thing. When you read verse 6 again, cast the net on the right side and you shall find they cast therefore now they were not able to draw it in. I think John's trying to teach us something here. He's saying there's an un, uncanny power. And that's probably a mild word to describe it. Within Jesus' words and our obedience to them. When Jesus makes a command and we obey it, it's amazing what is there. Let me give you three things just for here a minute. When we become obedient, there is a power that overcomes even our reasonable hesitations. Is this Jesus? Should I do that? Should I be obedient? Should I follow after what I've read or what I've heard, what I've, in the Word of God even? Should I be obedient? But somehow or another, when we read the Word of God and we're obedient to the Word of God, there's an uncanny power that's there that even overcomes any of our hesitations if we will just be obedient. You see, the Word of God and obedience to the Word of God can overcome those fears or those doubts if we will just be obedient. Let me give you the second thing. I'm not, I'm not ready for you to take notes yet. That's, I'm getting there. Okay? The second thing is, it can give us motivation as well. So when we become obedient, the power of God's Word also motivates us to be more obedient. So as we become obedient and we see how it works, and the hesitations and the doubts and fears are removed, Guess what it does? It empowers us to be what? More obedient. I'm going to go in detail here in just a minute. The third thing I saw is that it gives us the strength to obey more. So as we begin this circle of obedience, we understand the power that's there. We understand. It's amazing what it does when we become obedient. Fears and doubts are removed. I become, guess what? I become motivated to be more obedient. And I also then find the strength 
to obey in difficult situations, even in doubts and fears. Take your Bible, and here's where I'm going to ask you to take some notes, because it's not going to be on the screen. Go to the First John. Go to First John. Go ahead and turn there. First John chapter two. Now, a lot of people, there again, I'm probably addressing Christians more than anyone else here, just for a moment. Many people have asked me, is, is there a reason for this obedience? And I've given you some there. But let me take you to a little bit further, because what happens in the gospel, 1 John, I think, it's almost like a commentary on the gospel of John. So if you want to understand the truth deeper, that are given to us in John, those three simple truths, we're going to go to 1 John to find the commentary and understand a little bit deeper how we need to apply this to our life. And I hope that, as a child of God, you want to go deeper in the Word of God. So that's where we're going to start here just for a moment. So what I want you to do is have this circle drawn. And I'm going to give you six words to put around that circle, starting at the top, okay? Go with me to the text for a moment, and let's look at this cycle of obedience here just for a minute. 1 John chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 3. Actually, verses 1 and 2 of that chapter belong in chapter 1, but that's a debate we'll take on later. Verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know Him. Speaking of, how can we know that we know Jesus Christ? That's what it is. If we do what? If we keep His what? Okay, read it with me. Verse 4. He that saith, I know Him. So if you say, I'm a Christian, I know Him. And keepeth not His commandments. Oh, it's going to get tough now. He is a what? Oh, no. So he's saying if you're not obedient, if you say you're a Christian and you're not obedient, guess what you're doing? You're lying. And the truth, what truth am I talking about? The truth of the gospel, the truth of salvation, that is not within you. So you cannot tell me that you're a child of God and be disobedient to the Word of God. That's what John's saying here. Don't tell me you're a child. Don't tell me you're a believer, yet you're not obedient. Keep going. But whoso keepeth his word... In Him, verily, is the love of God perfected, matured. It's growing. We call that sanctification. We're becoming more like Christ. Keep going. Hereby, we know that we are in Him. So here's a cycle that John is showing us about what obedience does. Now, first of all, at the top of your circle, if you've got one, write the word learn. Okay, you can't be obedient until you learn what the Word of God says. Revelation, right? Woo! Okay? So learning requires, you're not going to like me, it requires reading the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God. Learning is more than just reading. If you don't read it and meditate on it, you know what the word meditate means? Let me give you the Dr. Mark definition. It means it's got to saturate you. Mind, body, spirit. That's meditation. It engulfs you. So the Word of God is not something that is just outside of you. It's inside. It permeates your mind, your thinking, your values, your actions, your thoughts, everything. That's what it means to meditate on the Word of God day and night. So meditation don't happen on Sunday morning. Okay, Meditation, listen to me, it don't happen by osmosis. You know what that is? I used to think you could do that in high school and college. You know, them books they give you, say, you got to read this before tomorrow. I'd put it underneath my pillow and lay my head on it. You know what? It didn't soak through. That's not the way it works. A lot of people think it works that way. Now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. Put my Bible under my pillow, and I'm good. God, right? No, that's not the way it works. 
So I must meditate. That means I take myself away from the distractions of the world and I think on the Word of God. Learning. So if I'm going to be obedient, the first thing I have to do is learn what God wants me to do. Meditate on it. Read it. Now, let me give you the second one around your circle, and this is a two-word slash. Obey and keep. Same word, but you can write obey or keep either one you want to. Now, let me say this. You're only going to be, have the ability to be obedient to the Word of God because of the grace of God. You don't have it within you to be obedient. It takes the grace of God working in your life to be obedient to keep the Word of God. Okay? Now, sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm told there's some things tonight you're not going to like, but sometimes God's grace puts us in trials and sufferings even like a pandemic, so that we will learn, guess what? The grace of God to be obedient and keep His Word. Sometimes you're going to be in struggles. That's part of God's grace. Why? Because He is challenging you. He's trying to get you to learn and understand and to be obedient and keep the Word of God. It's only going to happen through His grace. Uh, some have another, we think we have it within us that we can just, uh, that, you know, we're pretty good people, we can live and we can be obedient. I want you to understand, that's not going to happen unless you have the grace of God working in your life. You need the grace of God. Not oh, the grace of God will save you, but it's the grace of God that keeps you as well. So how am I going to have this motivation? How am I going to understand? How am I going to be obedient? Because the world is just pouring into me. Through every means that it can, social media, television, friends, people, everything. How am I going to have the, the power to be obedient? The grace of God. Now stay it with me, because I'm going to give you a big word you've got to write down. When I start keeping God's command, even if it's flawed in some way, even though I'm not doing it perfectly, through that, through keeping God's command, I gain what is called an experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. Experiential knowledge. E-X-P-E-R-I-E-N-T-I-A-L. Experiential knowledge. What does that mean? That means it's not something I just know in my head, but it's something that I experience in my life. I know Christ. I know Him. I don't know of Him. I know Him. Go back to my text in 1 John chapter 2. The only way I'm going to know Him is through what? Being obedient to His commandments. That's what the text tells you. So if I want to know Him beyond just who He is, and listen to me, there's a lot of people that know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. You know why? Because they're living in disobedience. They're living in disobedience. They'll never experience the peace of Jesus Christ. They'll never experience all the things that Jesus wants to pour in their life called the abundant life. That Jesus. They'll never get to experience Christ walking with Him. They'll never get to experience that. Why? Because they're living in disobedience to Him. Now, listen to me, dear Christian, just for a moment. I don't want you to miss out on that. I don't want you to miss out on knowing Jesus. Not not, not just coming to church and, 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 and hearing about Him and singing about Him. I want you to know Him. I can't even walk. Is that where you're at in your life? Without knowing Him. I want to know Him. I want to know His love. I want to know His peace. I want to know His joy. I want to know what it means to walk with Him. I want to experience Him. And listen to me, that's what God wants for us. Go back and look at my text. Hereby we know that we are what? In Him. He is in us. We are walking together. Experiencing life together. Is that how you know your relationship with Jesus Christ? Or, or is it just on Sunday? 
Woo, Jesus, praise the Lord, we're here on Sunday, we, get, we worship, and we, is, is that all you got? Is that how you're doing life with Jesus on Sunday? That's, that's it. Man, you're missing out. You're missing out. If, listen to me, if you're not forgiving the way Jesus said, you're holding grudges, guess what? You're missing out. Christ told us to forgive. You, you understand the problem that I got here. I'm afraid there are many Christians, we're missing out on really what Jesus wants us to have and what He wants us to experience in our life because we just will not be obedient. Let me give you, you're going around the circle, right? The next one, which should be number four, is grow. And I'm going to say in fellowship. So here again, stay with me. As we learn... And then we began to obey and keep those things. We began to experience Jesus Christ. And when we began to experience Jesus Christ, we grow in fellowship with God the Father as well. So as I increase my knowledge of Jesus Christ, guess what I do? I grow in fellowship in communion with Him. Now stay with me just for a moment. I'm going back to my text again in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, especially verse 3 right here. Stay with me. We must learn to act on what we believe to know Christ in a biblical sense. There again, it's not just enough to have it up here. I must put it into action if I really want to know Christ. Now, I'm going to make a statement, so stay with me just for a second. You may, have to, you may have to chew on it just a little bit. Obedience comes not just as a means for knowing God, but a motivation that drives us to know Him more. Remember, I gave you that motivation thing in number two? So when I become obedient, it's not just, oh, well, I know God. That's how I know God is to be obedient. So I'm going to be obedient. No, it goes beyond that because it drives me to know more about God. As I grow closer to Him, as I understand Him, as I know God, guess what it's going to do? It's going to motivate me. It's going to drive me. Paul uses the word compels me to know God even more. You see, that, that's what scares me about most Christians who are walking down the Christian life right now. You know what you're doing? You're being obedient just enough to say, I know Jesus. You're being obedient just enough to say, I'm getting into heaven. You're being obedient just enough when God is saying, listen to me, don't use obedience just as a means of knowing God but as a motivation to drive us to know Him even more. Do you have a passion in your life to know God more? Well, Brother Mark, I mean, I, you know, I come to church and, 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 and I, I, I do the things I'm supposed to do. I mean, I, I give, I sing, I pray, you know, I teach class, I do all those kind of things. You know, I'm being obedient. Is that where it's at? Is that where it ends? Because, see, I... I I truly believe if we're, if we're obedient the way God looks at us and we gain that experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ, listen to what it's going to do. It's going to drive you to know Him more. See, I think that's where Christians are living. I don't know if we have a passion to know God. We want to know about Him. Brother Mark, teach me some facts. Teach me some figures. Teach me the, some Greek words and Hebrew words. Teach me some things about the Bible. No, listen to me. I want you to know God. I want you to be motivated in your life that you want to be so obedient that it's not just a means to get you into heaven or to know... I want you to drive you to know God more. Are you being obedient? Because listen to me, you miss out on that, that key thing. You know, I look around and I think, man, how many Christians tonight are motivated to do what it takes to know God? Because, you know, we, we, we do the simple things. We, this sounds bad. We do the easy things. But when it comes to sacrifice, whoa, hold on a minute. 
when it comes there again to, to giving up some things that we enjoy doing. And you know, I'm not going to be that obedient. I mean, I want to I get to heaven, Brother Mark. I want to be a good person. But my question is, do you want to know God? Are you driven by that obedience? Okay, now stay with me for a minute. So we've learned, we're starting to obey and keep. We uh, have some experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ and our walk with Him, the joy and the peace that's there, all the strength that He gives. And then we have this knowledge there again, and we're growing in fellowship with the Father. Now sh- let me show you why this is so important. That knowledge that you gain through the experience of keeping God's commandments, here's what it does. It gives you an assurance in your life. If there's one thing that Christians struggle with, most Christians in church, is the assurance that they know Christ as their Savior and they're on their way to heaven. That's what we struggle with. Look what John wrote. That we may, what? Know that we have come to know Him. John's trying to leave no doubt. You see, he's saying when you're obedient and you become, there again, you learn and become obedient, you experience this knowledge of Jesus Christ, you're growing in your communion with the Father, fellowship with the Father. At that point in time, guess what? There's an assurance that you have. I know God. I am obedient. I've experienced this love of God and this relationship with, through God, through Jesus Christ. I know that I know. Is that where you're at? You see, most Christians are at this point, I know, and that's it. But John writes, I want you to know that you know that you're on your way to heaven, that Christ is your Savior. You have no doubt. You know why? Listen, this is so important. Because Satan wants you to live in that doubt. Because if you are in that doubt, listen to me, if you're living in that doubt, you're not going to be a witness. You're not going to go tell anybody else about Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because you're not even sure He is. You're not even sure that you know Him. You're not even sure that you know what He wants you to do. And so guess what? You're living in doubt. You're living in fear almost that you don't even know if you're going to get to heaven. That you know Christ. And so guess what? That's exactly where Satan wants you. John said you can have assurance. It all starts with what? Obedience. You know why most people don't have assurance? Because they're living in disobedience to God. You live in disobedience. Listen to me. That's that's a dangerous place to trod. That's a dangerous path to go in. Because then you don't have assurance. Then you're not a witness. Then you can't live. You, You miss out on so much because you're afraid. I don't even know if I'm going to make it or not. Listen to me. We got some dear good friends, and I got a bunch of them, who believe in... Calvinistic theology, once saved, always saved, however you want to say it. And they tell us as free will baptists, we have no assurance. I'm telling you, I believe First John chapter 2 that says, I know that I know. I have no doubt. Why? Because I'm trying to follow this cycle of obedience, of reading and understanding and meditating and obeying and keeping and gaining that knowledge with Jesus Christ and growing in my fellowship with the Father. And guess what? Because of that, I have assurance tonight. And it's all because of Jesus and obedience to His Word. Now it gets better. Aren't you thankful? Go back with me. But whoso keepeth His Word in Him, verily is the love of God, what? Perfected. When when are we going to be perfect? Hmm. In heaven. Not now. Some of y'all think you are, but you're not. Um, One day we will be with Him, right? Through that assurance, through obedience, through that fellowship and that knowledge, John tells us one day we will be with Him. You see, the knowledge that I have of that assurance of the Word of God and obedience to His... Look what it does. Here's the last word. It reveals the glory of God. 
And that motivates us to a deeper understanding of Scripture. There again, I learned how to, I gain a better understanding of how to obey Christ when His glory is revealed to us. So you should have made the whole circle. So as I learn and meditate, I'm empowered by the grace of God to be obedient and keep His commandments. And then I gain an experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ, not just in my head, but in my heart, in my life. I grow in fellowship with the Father, and through that I have assurance. Because I have assurance with God, He reveals His glory to me. And because He reveals His glory to me, it motivates me to do what? Dig deeper in the Scripture to know Him more, so I can be what? Motivated to be more obedient. And it starts all over again. God revealing Himself to me in His Word. Never stops. Isn't it amazing how God gave us that truth? It's just simple obedience. But oh, it's so hard, right? <laughs> obedience is not easy. I wish I could tell you, man, <laughs> all you got to do is just obey. There ain't nothing to it. <clears throat> you know what? There is something to it. It's hard. Ask your children. It's hard. Remember when you was growing up? It's hard. And need I give you, I'm not going to give you the sermon right now. But remember what it means to be obedient? It's doing what I'm told, when I'm told, how I'm told, and with the right attitude. That's obedience. Did you catch that? Are you obedient? Oh, yes. You doing what you're told? Yes, I am, Brother Mark. You doing when you're told it? Well, I'll get around to it. That's not obedience. You're doing how you're told? Well, I'm going to do part of it. Then you're not being obedient. Well, Brother Mark, I'm doing what I'm told. I'm doing when I'm told. I'm doing it how I'm told. You got the right attitude? Nah. I'm doing it kicking and screaming all the way. Is that obedient? Nope. You see, be obedient to God. You do it when, where, how with the right attitude. That's obedience. Whew, that's hard. So go back to my text in John chapter 21. The first miracle, they were obedient. And then watch what the, their obedience does. There again, it removes their fears and their doubts. It motivated them to obey more, and it even strengthened them to obey. So here's what I want you to take away. Think with me just for a moment. Jesus' word graciously enables the very counsel that it commends. So what God's Word says do, guess what? It enables us, through the cycle, to what? Be obedient. So whatever it tells us, whatever it commands us to do, listen to me, it don't leave us hanging out there to figure it out on our own, in our own power, in our own strength. Guess what it does? It enables us, through that circle of obedience, to do exactly what He called us to do. So don't ever, listen to me, don't ever let me hear you say, I can't. If you're obedient... You can. You can. I'm not telling you it's easy. But I'm telling you there's a way that God has provided, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3-5, through 5, that you can be obedient if you choose to. Second miracle. Go back to my text. One was, there again, obedience. The second one that I see there is they caught fish. Remember now, they've been fishing all night long. They had caught what? Nada. Nothing. However, whatever word you want to plug in there, nothing. But isn't it amazing that Jesus' word, and it's obeyed, that catching becomes very catching. Think back to what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He said, follow me and I will make you, what? Catching fishers of people or men. You see, the, the fish in our present account are meant to represent the people whom Jesus' disciples are going to catch when they simply are obedient to Jesus' clear command. So when we're obedient, it's amazing what God will do and what God will abundantly do. Remember, Christ said, I come to give you life and give you life what? So if I'm obedient, guess what I'm get, going to get to experience? 
the abundant life, right? You know what it means? Help me. I'm not going to have abundant life by planting seeds of faith and, 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 and uh, having prayer cloths. And, 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 no. Jesus said you're going to experience the abundant life of Jesus Christ, peace, joy, all those things Christ is going to pour into our life when you are what? Obedient to the Word. Man, this obedience thing is getting old, isn't it? That's all he wants me to do is be obedient. Now stay with me for a moment. They are, they are, they're going to be obedient in verse 6. But guess what? When they were failing miserably at what they thought they were good at, that's when Jesus says, be obedient. Mm. Did you catch that? When you're failing miserably at what you think you're good at. Well, Brother Mark, I'm a, I'm a pretty good Christian. I got it all together. I mean, guess what? I got a big old King James Bible. I got my suit. I got it all figured out. I got Tithe L. Wild on my phone. We're good. And guess what? You fail. You fall miserably in the sin. So what does God ask you to do? He says in the middle of that failure, guess what you need to do? Be obedient. Wow. Is that what you're doing? Are you being obedient to what God has called you to do? Are you being obedient to His Word? Because listen to me, in obedience to the Word of God, that's going to enable us and empower us. I would go back to my cycle again. So when I become obedient, look what happens to the disciples. Guess what? They're obedient and immediately we see the empowering Word of God. We see immediately we see the enabling Word of God. It's not an easy task to do what they did. So when Jesus reveals Himself through His Word and His words, He empowers those who receive them, one, to respond to Him. Did you catch that? So when the Word of God is shared, the power of the Word of God enables people to respond to the Word. You're hearing the Word. And you have the ability now, because you have heard the truth, and you understand the truth of the Word of God about obedience, you have now been empowered to make a decision to be obedient. You got it in you. Did you know that? You got it. You've got the power right now to make the decision, am I going to be obedient? Because you have now been enabled because you now know the truth. Let me make a statement. Chew on it for a minute. Anytime Jesus reveals Himself, it rarely ends just in Himself. Um, Or let me say, themselves. So as Jesus begins to reveal Himself to the disciples... That's rarely where it ends. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In Acts chapter 9, when the apostle Paul, then Saul, is converted, it didn't stop just with his conversion, but he was also commissioned. So as God begins to reveal Himself in your life, not only is it just there, is the Word of God just there to change you, to make you a believer in Jesus Christ, but it is there to commission you to serve Jesus Christ as well. Um, Remember the invitation that Jesus gave. It was, follow me. Listen to me. Remember I read to you uh, Matthew chapter 4. Jesus said, follow me and I will do what? Make you fishers of men or catching people. He did not say, follow me and I'll save your soul, even though He did that. Follow me. Here's what it says. It was, follow me, and I will enable you to bring other people to Christ. That's what it said. Follow me. Surrender your life to me. Accept me as the Savior of your life, and I will, there again, commissioning. So, Brother Mark, what are you trying to tell me? Here's what I'm trying to tell you tonight. God has revealed Himself to you you through the person of Jesus Christ, not just to save you, but to do what? Commission you and enable you to go out and reach others. Follow me, 
and I'll make you fishers of men. So you have now been saved, and now you have been empowered and enabled through obedience to do what? Go and tell other people about Jesus Christ. It's true of the Old Testament as well. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 of Abraham. So listen to me, it's more than just salvation, even though that's fantastic. But why were you saved? Go back to Matthew chapter 4. Follow me and I'll do what? Make you fishers of men. Follow me, obedience. Follow me. And I will enable you, I will empower you to become fishers of men. Now stay with me just for a second. If, if one thing in the last several weeks, what I've heard most people say, is you know what? Very few, and I don't want to give you numbers, but stay with me. Very few Christians ever share their testimony or the truth of the gospel with anyone else. They will invite somebody to church, but they're not going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Very few Christians do that. And I begin to ask myself, why? And I think it's revealed in this text. You know what it is? It's called disobedience. It, I, I hate to tell you, but it's just disobedience. Well, Brother Mark, I'm not a very good speaker. Well, Brother Mark, I just don't... I, Brother Mark, I've heard... Jesus heard all the excuses you can imagine. Did you know that? You know why Christians are not sharing the gospel the way that they should? They got to follow me. They just forgot... I make you fishers of men. I've empowered you. I've enabled you to go out and reach others with the gospel. They forgot that part. We got follow me. We did it in an altar. We did it in our room somewhere. We did it at a bedside. We got follow me, but we missed make you fishers of men. Christ didn't just save us to save us. He saved us so we'd reach others to bring glory to Him. So let me ask you a question. Are you being obedient tonight? Because see, if you say yes, you know what? Man, this, this room's going to be full of people next Sunday. Because you know what? You went out and you witnessed to somebody. You told somebody about the gospel of Jesus Christ and their life was changed. And you know what? They're going to want to come and hear where you heard about it. You're the gun fishers of men. You're going to start bringing people to Christ. You know why? Because you're going to choose to be obedient. That's my question tonight. Will you be obedient? Follow that circle. Because see, when you start to be obedient, guess what happens? Then you start to know Christ. You start walking in fellowship with His Father. And that's going to motivate you to bring people to Christ, to know His glory. And it's going to start all over. As you learn more about Him, you're going to want somebody to know. You're going to experience Jesus Christ. You're going to become obedient. You're going to see the glory of the Father. Guess what? It's going to start all over again. The question is tonight, will you be obedient? Let's pray together. Our Father, thank You for the Word of God, the truth that's there. Lord, a simple question tonight is, will we be obedient? One, will we be obedient in following Him? Will we trust Christ as our Savior? Will we surrender everything else and trust Him? Will we follow Him? Will we walk away from our friends, our families, all those things that are dragging us down? Will we walk away from them and just trust Christ as our Savior? And then, Lord, will we be obedient, knowing You, walking with You, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others so that we can know the glory of God revealed in us. And one day we will stand before you and we will hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Are we being obedient tonight? When we're obedient, we have that assurance. Maybe there's some Christians that are here today they're just not sure. Maybe they need to trace it back to are they being obedient? Are they doing what God has commanded? Are they allowed sin into their life? And that sin has separated them from you. 
Lord, help us tonight to be obedient. I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Simple question. Will you be obedient to the call? He's calling you right now to salvation. He's calling you right now to obedience and sacrifice. Will you obey Him? Will you obey Him as we sing together? Come every soul by sin oppressed. You believe There's that? There's mercy with mercy the, with the Lord. Lord. And He will surely give that abundant life, rest that rest by trusting trust His Word. His Word. Will you trust Him tonight? Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. All God's people said, Amen. I do encourage you, don't forget tomorrow night, celebrate recovery. All of our Bible studies on Wednesdays, remember those things. If you can help us with Truck or Treat in our fall festival, there's a sign-up list out in the foyer. If you have any questions, see Brother Matthew. He'll get you the answers uh, that you need where you can plug in to be helpful. Uh, we got a lot of things we need done, but mainly we need you to help us with our Truck or Treat, okay? So get you a bicycle, get you a motorcycle, a car, truck, whatever you got, wagon, decorate it up, get you some candy and give it out to these kids who's going to be coming uh, to our trunk or treat. Yes. Trunk or treat. Yeah. Yeah, if you can help with food, registration, greeting people, all that stuff, make sure you see him. Okay, any others? All right, good to have you here. Sing one more time with Brother Phil. You're dismissed. Could even walk without you holding my hand. The mountains too high and the valleys too wide. Down on my knees I learned to stand. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand.